Welcome to today's webinar. For decades, the sanctuary movement in the US and in Canada and the church asylum movements in Germany and in the rest of Europe have been on an ongoing exchange. The players of the global migration regimes cooperate and learn from each other, and I think so should we. So during our webinar series this year, we are discussing the creation of places and spaces that keep people alive, that empower and that expose the racist divisions the migration regimes rely on. From crossing borders, during the asylum procedures, that's today, and when facing deportation, that's next week. I guess in the meantime, um, I just want to uh, say thank you again for everyone joining us uh, today. We're very excited. Um, I'm very honored uh, to be with this amazing uh, women and uh, learn from them and, and their experiences. Um, some of them I've gotten to meet uh, through organizing work um, and you know, some of our old and new friends as well. Um, and you know, very excited to be with everyone who's also joining us via Zoom, um, other friends from, from all over the place. Um, as uh, Ulrich was saying, uh, feel free to keep posting comments on the chat and we'll leave uh, 20 minutes at the end for Q&A uh, with our speakers. Um, and I guess I'll introduce myself as well. For those of you uh, who don't know me, my name is Elke Vega. I'm originally from the US-Mexico borderlands. Um, I've been working on migration and human rights, I guess, in general for um, the past 10 years or so. Um, and I'm currently completing a master's um, at the University of Geneva. Um, and so I'm, I'm currently here and so <laughs> uh, excited to uh, introduce our speakers today or uh, um, tonight, depending where you're joining us from. Um, let's see if uh, checking in Ulrin, it's Rick is joining us. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers. Um, okay. I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and um, introduce our speakers uh, for today. Um, so the first uh, panelist I would like to introduce to you is uh, my dear friend Bethy Ngari or Elizabeth Ngari, uh, who I had the pleasure to meet a couple of years ago uh, during her visit to the US-Mexico borderlands. Uh, she is the founder of Women in Exile, uh, an initiative of refugee women uh, founded in Brandenburg, Germany is just outside of Berlin in 2002 um, by refugee women uh, to fight for the rice. And so a group uh, led by Betty um, decided to organize as refugee women uh, because of their particular experience um, as women, refugee women uh, being doubly discriminated against not only by racist laws and discriminatory, discriminatory refugee laws as well, but just as well in general as their, as their experience as women, right? And so this is sometimes um, the stories of, of women in migration is what we're lacking to hear. And so um, I think their experiences were very unique. And so recognizing such, uh, they came together to, to organize and, and uh, fight for their rights. And more recently in 2011, uh, Women in Exile and uh, in France uh, was formed in conjunction uh, with uh, the group of women in exile, as well as activists uh, in solidarity without a refugee background. Um, and together they are running um, the campaign title, No Lager for Women, Abolish All Lagers. And this is with uh, reference to the refugee camps that are especially prevalent uh, in Europe and, and other parts of, um, of the Middle East as well. Um, let me just check on the real quick. Perfect. So very excited to have um, uh, her with us today. We also want to um, go ahead and um, uh, give a big thank for uh, Claudia Gomez, who is uh, joining us. Claudia, who I just recently had the pleasure to meet. Uh, she's an Afro-Colombian artist, uh, also occupational therapist, a refugee and former resident of the Romero House in Toronto. Uh, she is the founder of the Intercultural Collective Ethnicities in Cali, Colombia, and in Toronto as well. Um, and she works here as an activist uh, through the arts, um, dance, theater, music, and handcrafts. 
uh, and through the arts, she demands human rights in Colombia in general, and more specifically also for the Afro-Colombian population. Um, she's part of the Truth Commission of Colombia North Ontario, and she's looking to clarify um, through this activism, the truth about what has happened in these communities and uh, in the frame of art conflicts in Colombia, uh, which was has been one of the largest and most cruel conflicts around the world. Um, and so uh, also working you know, with Colombian victims of armed conflicts for um, the past eight years or so. Um, and then finally, I would like to um, introduce a dear friend of mine too from El Paso, Juarez Borderlands, uh, Hannah Hollenberg, um, who um, is uh, presenting for us, uh, our friend uh, uh, and colleague Marisa uh, wasn't able to join us, but Hannah was uh, incredibly generous uh, to join us today um, and share with us more a little bit about uh, the policy and asylum situation at the US-Mexico borders. Um, so Hannah is also originally from El Paso and, and Ciudad Juarez borderlands, and uh, she's a special projects coordinator at Hope Water Institute. Uh, and she's a graduate student of Columbia University where she received a bachelor's in human rights. Um, previously, she has worked for the Fund for Global Human Rights and as a staffer for a US Senate campaign. Um, and she's also very passionate about border rights uh, and policy. So very, very excited to have this wonderful woman in our panel today. And, and lastly, I would also like to uh, thank the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for their generosity in supporting uh, and continue to support uh, this webinar series um, and, and the different um, activists and, and initiatives of, of the organization and network. So very excited to have everyone with us today. Um, I also just want to acknowledge, um, you know, all the different borders and asylum contexts that we are coming from, uh, not only, you know, here in the panel, with our amazing panelists, um, but also our friends uh, who are joining us today for this Zoom call. And so um, I think this is a very unique space uh, to be discussing this issue and very, very thankful to be here with, with all of you. Um, and I guess I will get started with our first round of questions. And I would like to ask um, our panelists to turn their cameras on. So perhaps we can um, spotlight when you speak um, so Betty and, and Claudia, um, I'd like to invite you to turn your camera on if possible. And I guess my, my first question will go to you, Betty. <laughs> um, um, first of all, thank you again for being here and hello again. Um, I, I wanted to ask you um, to tell us a little bit more about what has brought you to the work um, and you know what the asylum process and situation where you are um, has been like uh, perhaps as well some of the challenges uh, or focus of your work uh, for the past uh, decade or so that you've been engaged with um, and just to elaborate from 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 your context uh, and your and your borders thank you Haika. um hello everybody thank you for having me this evening um yeah, um, I would start a little bit about how also like uh, you talked about how we went on and how we started, but I can also say a little bit of how why we did we did start this uh, because most of us we were living in the camps ourselves and uh, we experienced a lot of. Uh, uh, the camps in Germany, I would say, first of all, they are very isolated. So this is also something um, which made us see what type of conditions we were living in, because we could see this uh, type of accommodation was, first of all, very racist because it was discriminative. Uh, you are living in an isolated uh Sometimes uh, it could be former barracks, which are really situated inside the forest and all that. And you have no contact, the community is allowed. And when you do also go to the streets, you can also uh, experience um, racist, um, uh, you, you find yourself okay being, uh, having also racist uh, people who are allowed and they are, you, are, you have these abuses all the time. You um, 
from the camps. It's already inside itself. There are a lot of conflicts going on because people are crowded and they are put together, women, men, people from different uh, uh, origins and with different uh, backgrounds, I would say. And then um, we find that the women who are having more problems, especially women with children or even single women because they were being harassed sexually, violated sexually. And also the children, like I say, um, they couldn't sleep at night or even those who are going to school could not concentrate on their on learning because it was like uh, in, the, in these camps, like everybody was idle and uh, they couldn't, they, they, they had no, there was no possibilities of working or going to school. So people slept during the day and at night they were making noise, they were awake. And uh, so we saw that this is not a good uh, surrounding for kids and women especially. And this is why we started the women group. Uh, we have been having a lot of challenges on the way because, um, like I say, these camps already are invisible borders, which nobody really realizes, and um, the communities allowed don't really um, care about those living in these camps because it's like um, the the government already makes it like they are isolated and that they put these uh, social conditions like you are there, you only get this social money, you can't work, you, you don't have possibilities of working, going to school, a lot of things are, are not allowed. Movement is also a problem to move from one district to another. Sometimes you've got to have permission. This is still on today. Sometimes they relax this a little bit, but it's still happening today that uh, there are people who have to ask for permission to move out of this, um, to move from one district to another. And these are the type of law we try to fight from the woman's perspective, because we understand that we are not only refugees, but we are women and we are suffering us as women in these camps. And so, um, we started empowering women, especially we started doing empowerment workshops and uh, we, the women were, we tried to find a way to come together and talk and find out what our present problems are and then bring them into the public. And this is how we even joined the, the people without uh, migration background because this way we decided to fight together as women and bring this, uh, these uh, problems into the public and um, like, uh, yeah, put them into a political um, agenda and try to, to bring the problems to the directory to the people who are in charge, like if it's a ministry, if it's the social ministry or if it's the uh, ministry which is um, dealing with refugee, like then we bring this into the open. And from this, we have done uh, several, we do several actions. We go around the country. We have uh, managed to build a network of refugee women in the, like uh, in many uh, states in German. We do these bus tours. We did once a love tour, which was from the south up to Berlin. So in every state, we try to go and put these problems into the open. Of course, we didn't uh, succeed a lot because we are not uh, people who are voting in this society. So to change the laws, it needs also the, you know, like the people who are voting to change these laws. But we try also to, yeah, to synthesize the communities that, okay, these, are not, these laws are not good for, for human, I mean, these living conditions especially are not going good for humans. And um, we, are, we are still fighting, I would say this. Uh, of course, on the way, there are a lot of things. There are things like deportation, and we see all this centered into this rather system, the camp system of, uh, of uh, 
of accommodation because if we look at um, deportations, they sometimes they are very brutal. The police would come in the middle of the night and uh, take people by force to take them to the airports or to take them to detention camps. And if um, then they are also the 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 violence against women is still going on and all this and sometimes depending on the on what is uh like sometimes when they there are more people to live in the camp then there are a lot of conflicts and um then it's like all this is put together and we have also problems like the COVID-19 when this type of uh, accommodation is bringing a lot of problems, I mean a lot of um, problems and people are infecting one another, a lot of uh, forced quarantine. Um, and also what is the most also uh, the problem which is also suffered by most is that we cannot speak the language or it's very difficult also to learn the language. German is a difficult language actually. And at times it's very, um, it's not easy also for the people to come uh, into contact with other people. And as women in exile, we try to bring uh, the refugee, especially women with the uh, other women from the society, the ones especially we are together, those who don't have uh, migration background. Thank you, Vetti. And I think it's very important um, what, what you're sharing and learning also what the what the situation in, in Germany looks like, at least in, in one of these uh, refugee um, camps, right? As, as Germany is like one of the countries receiving the largest amounts of refugees in Europe. Um, I think it's very important to your perspective on sharing um, what what the situation like is there, and 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 particularly this the challenges that women face, and and also you know the isolation and invisibility of these communities that you were sharing, and um, so thank you for for your efforts in facing this and um, giving voice back uh, and and make visible this these issues and um, and the communities that are that are here with us. Um, now I would like to. Uh, uh, Cross the, the Atlantic uh, with our friend uh, Claudia. And uh, Claudia, um, I would like for you to share with us um, about your experiences also with the asylum process in Canada and you know what the hospitality has been like there. Um, perhaps also some of uh, the challenges that you faced through the process um, and you know just about your context um, and perhaps also the situation at home um, and just a little to give us a little bit more insight onto what has been happening in, in Colombia. Hello everyone. Uh, it is so glad to me share, to share with you this space, this space because it is so very important to, to know, to talk about uh, too many issues that we are we are facing as a human around the world um yeah uh we in, in colombia we have a a largest 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 armed conflict and it was it has been has been one of the more terrible um, violent and sadistic around the world, and we and it is it had caused by uh, the recently in the recently history is had uh, I'm talking about seventy or it, between seventy or fifty years. Um, it had it had caused for. Um, narcotraffic, you know, and uh, we and for that we around the world we are seen like a narcotraffic can't narcotraffic people, and we have a stigma, and in 
in a, a lot of country to Colombian people need to to get a visa to go even to visit you know but in Colombia uh, there are uh, many many too many people uh, uh, facing uh, threatens facing uh, dangers uh, for their life because in Colombia every every voice uh, highlight every voice against or in disagree with the with the with the government is looked as an enemy and if we if we are Afro-Colombian, the situation is even worse because uh, in Colombia, the, there are, I don't know, I don't remember, it's because the this situation changed with the pandemic, but today we are most of 60% poor people, but Apart this 60 percent, we are, we have more than 20 percent people living in extreme poverty, and in this people living in poverty and extreme poverty, there are a lot. There are there are there are the most Afro-Colombian community and indigenous community, and if this is our panorama, uh, when there are a uh, big conflict when people is is seen as a as an enemy if if you have just uh, disagree with with the government or with the politics um, and the people is so poverty so poor and if uh, most of the country have uh, ask asked to us for a visa we are like uh, in prison in Colombia, especially poorest people, because we we can we cannot go outside to save our life. It is so so difficult. For example, to come to can to come to Canada. Uh, also, Colombia and Canada have a free trade agreement. Colombian people cannot come to Canada unless they have a visa. But in order to be eligible, they need to demonstrate a large economic solvency and prove to an immigration agent that they are not looking to stay in Canada. And it is no, and even it is not possible to do a refugee claim staying or living in Colombia. You know, and it is a terrible situation because the, in Colombia, all the days, without exception, are being assassinated people because, because there are social leaders or farmers or Afro-Colombian leaders or indigenous leaders or a student or mother who ask for, for justice or, oh my God, teachers or uh, union workers or, yeah. And we, we, we are facing this situation. We are there uh, just, just trying to, to survive. But it is like a, the world, it is not supporting our main right, human right, that it is the life. Yeah. Thank you, Claudia, for sharing with us uh, on, on your personal experience and also, I guess, that human lens um, to what sometimes we might learn from far away, uh, uh, but um, really embodying it and, and, and bringing that, um, that perspective, I think it's very important for us to um, have a better understanding of you know, some of the reasons why 
increasingly people are uh, forced to migrate, especially in this part of Latin America and, you know, the, the role of um, the systems that, you know, reinforce each other um, and uh, this narco traffic and cartels and systems of violence uh, that, and, and poverty uh, ultimately that are interconnected, right? And um, that are forcing many communities to, to flee and um, the dangers that, you know, vulnerable populations and as you share the Afro-Colombian community is particularly facing in, in, in Colombia and um, also the uncertainty that, the uncertainty and the possibility of this visa processes that um, seem to pose more challenges, especially for those that need them the most. Um, so thank you for, for sharing that perspective with us. And um, I think it's also important for us to um, keep in mind how this, uh, you know, in terms of processes of asylum or, or getting visas, it's not really a straightforward um, option for people. And indeed, it's, it's some of the most bureaucratic, lengthy and uh, challenging processes that, that we can, that anyone could go through. Um, and so when we were talking, you know, um, about facing additional barriers due to um, policies of uh, xenophobia and um, things, contexts and situations that are changing very rapidly. Um, I think that really resonates also with, you know, what has been going on at the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, what, you know, my experience has also been working there um, and dealing with, you know, narrative um, attacks, uh, reading with xenophobic policies and, you know, um, bureaucratic uh, barriers that change every week and just make it even more impossible for people. Um, and so I guess to expand a little bit more on that, um, maybe uh, in this other <laughs> part of the, of uh, in this other border, the US-Mexico border, maybe I would like to invite Hannah here to give us a little bit more context um, on what the situation currently is in, in the US-Mexico borderlands and perhaps how it has changed uh, in comparison to the last couple of years or so. Um, I know some people will be very interested in know um, if there's been any changes with, with the new administration. Um, yes, thank you so much for the invitation to, to be part of this event. Um, I work with uh, Hope Border Institute in El Paso, as Ilka mentioned, and um, Ilka used to be with us, um, but and always is with us. Um, so we work in, in El Paso, Texas, and also in Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, which are um, sister cities, you know, in the sort of West Texas, um, Northern Chihuahua region. And um, migration has always been part of our landscape and just part of, you know, movement in general is part of who we are as a community. And, um, you know, it's not, it's very common for people to live their lives on both sides of the border. Um, and then in the last several years, we've also seen um, increasing arrivals of people mostly from Central America as well as from Mexico and then um, even people from you know as far away as Democratic Republic of the Congo or um, Uganda you know people from South America um, even now you know I th believe there are increasing numbers of people from from India and, and other parts of Asia who are coming to the border but it's it's been mostly people from Central America and from Mexico. And um, as a border community, we we don't have a lot of say over how we choose to live our lives and how we choose to um, govern our govern or manage our our border. Um, and so instead of adopting policies that, embrace the community-centered vision of what a border community should look like. We are often subjected to policies that are attempting to harden the border even more. So, um, so our you know, vision of a border community where people can cross back and forth freely, where refugees and asylum seekers can um, easily access our bridges and our ports of entry, uh, if they're fleeing, you know, a vision of a, of a well-managed, um, 
you know, system that recognizes that we are one community and that we live across two countries, that that vision is not um, often honored by the U.S. government. And so one um, trend that we've seen consistently over the past several years in the Trump administration and also now in the Biden administration is not just hardening the border, um, making it harder for everyone to cross, making it more dangerous, making it more violent. We've also seen the border being externalized. So, um, you know, the U.S. has a responsibility to um, welcome asylum seekers and refugees. Obviously, that's part of our domestic law as well as, um, you know, international law. But more and more, we're seeing the U.S. government push its responsibility outward towards Mexico and even towards countries in Central America. And uh, we see that in, in many different forms. For example, the Remain in Mexico policy um, was put in place under the Trump administration. And under that policy, um, migrants and asylum seekers were forced to, um, to stay in cities in Northern Mexico to wait out their asylum cases. Whereas before people had been allowed to access US territory, be with family um, in the US and proceed with their asylum claim there. Um, under this program, Remain in Mexico, people were forced to stay in Mexico, um, wait out their asylum case, still make it to court hearings in the US. Um, and the intent behind the program was to make it as difficult as possible for people to proceed with the case. So, you know, if people were, if a family, say from Honduras, was in the program, they faced a lot of, um, there's a lot of discrimination against them, uh, a lot of insecurities that, that made them extremely vulnerable when they were forced back to Mexico. Um, you know, it was a sort of a program that was designed to make it as hellish and as bureaucratic as possible to seek asylum. And so, you know, people would have a court case in El Paso, um, for instance, a 9 a.m. appointment for, a, you know, a court hearing before a judge. Um, and they would be asked to present themselves at the port of entry at 4 a.m., for example. And so if you're, let's say, a family with young children or anyone, you know, traveling through certain areas at night when it's very dark, it's incredibly dangerous. And so we have, we know of multiple, you know, hundreds of cases of people who weren't able to make it to their court appointment because they were, um, you know, because they were afraid to leave, they were afraid to travel at night, or they were kidnapped on the way, or they got sick and they couldn't make it, or something happened to a family member and they couldn't make it. And then because they weren't, you know, in court, they were deported in absentia. And so um, that was a policy that we fought against for a long time. Uh, and thankfully it's been officially terminated as of yesterday. Um, it's been in a process of being unwound for the past few months. And so we're, we're really grateful to now be welcoming people who were forced to be in that program. Um, we're welcoming them out of the program. So. Actually, in about an hour or so, I'll probably go to the bridge, and we have um, we've set up kind of a volunteer system to welcome people, uh, receive them, give them a basic orientation, and make sure that they know what their options are um, as far as next steps. But um, that's been an, you know a wonderful example of how civil society kind of fills in the gaps and creates spaces of sanctuary for you know in situations where there's not a more holistic vision of, of sanctuary, but um, we're, we're continuing to see other policies like Title 42, which is an expulsion policy. So anyone who um, arrives you know, at the border currently seeking asylum is immediately expelled back to Mexico. Um, so we're continuing to see you know, borders being externalized and kind of these policies of enforcement and militarization be be pushed outward, um, as well as seeing our own border hardened. So our job as, as Hope Border Institute has been to work with others to create kind of sanctuary spaces where 
even in this kind of nightmare of a system that we have to work with, we can create some spaces of, of sanctuary with a vision towards ultimately creating a whole system that's based on sanctuary and respecting human rights. Thank you, Hannah, and um, thank you for sharing on, um, on these challenges that local communities are also uh, facing in, in regard of uh, topics of, of asylum and in welcoming communities and perhaps the contrast that exists with federal policies on this issue that are, as you said, uh, creating these policies of deterrence and militarization and um, just putting people in more precarious conditions, um, so just through the Remain in Mexico policy and um, really giving us a lot to think about uh, what it means to, you know, create sanctuary cities or spaces of sanctuary at least. Um, and I think we often talk about, you know, how we can uh, create change uh, and how can we improve situations through this uh, asylum process and how do, can we accompany people better. And I think um, the three of you here have uh, also spoken uh, from different levels of action um, at the high level uh, policy spectrum, you know, and, and the role of those federal policies and, as you say, externalizing the border um, and the influence that those federal policies have uh, at the borders or points of entry and through asylum processes that people have, but then also the role of uh, humanitarian organizations and civil society in welcoming and providing essential services and, um, and stepping up, I guess, where uh, the system simply abandons people many times or uh, fails to see the specific needs uh, that uh, that different populations have, such as is in the case of um, the the refugee camps in, um, in in Germany as well, and and women facing all these challenges because of the isolation um, and the turning away uh, of of uh, the government to providing more services and really integrating people better. Um, but then also, um, I think the the importance of of connecting to people through um, a personal level and the the impact. Uh, that uh, being present for people uh, can have just at the human level, even beyond the logistics and all this um, bureaucratic barriers, right? Also the need for uh, being there for people in terms of their emotional uh, needs, uh, especially through this uh, very intense and emotionally uh, intense process of, of, of asylum, but then also going through you know, this journeys uh, and and trying to flee these communities that are increasingly uh, in danger in many of the areas where people are coming from. Um, and so I think it gives us a lot also to think um, of how to create safe spaces from a holistic perspective, a, a 360 perspective, uh, uh, really putting human dignity at the center of it um, and, and realizing, I guess, how uh, solidarity is also a transformative process, uh, not only for the people and families being welcomed, but also uh, for those in a position to help at different times. Um, you know, and, and this occurs through through mutual empowerment. And I think that's an important realization uh, for everyone in, in all areas of the spectrum to have uh, for, for us to really to continue to do this work and see how we're mutually empowerment through, through this movement of, of solidarity across borders. Um, and so I would love for um, Betty and Claudia also to tell us a little bit more, uh, and Hannah as well, and, and the role of the community to tell us a little bit more on the transformative um, and empowering areas of your work. And also what your experience has been, you know, as women of color um, has been shaped or informed your work uh, and made, you know, you more attuned for the needs uh, of other women and also with different populations that you're working with. Um, on how to better address uh, these needs and how, where have you seen the empowerment and I guess the hope that keeps you going through your work and maybe Betty, you can share some words with us uh, to get us started on that. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah. Um... This is a difficult question because uh, sometimes uh, you see one or two people get uh, like go through this process and they get either the asylum or they find ways to uh, to 
get residents which are very different. People can get, can get married or, um, yeah, or like there's this, uh, in German, there's this way where the, some people who have hardships can get, uh, there's this program where they look at hardships of people who are vulnerable and then um, there's this process which is used where you can get also your stay. I'm always happy, I'm always empowered when I see someone really has um, status that can enable them to have all the other things which we, which are points they are privileges to the people who don't have um, proper stay. And uh, this, this empowerment workshops we have, and I think these ones, I see them also very empowering because um, the refugee women themselves learn to give these workshops. Some of them are not, um, at, at the beginning, they don't have the courage or to talk in public or to, you know, like they are shy or they are not, uh, they feel they are not, they cannot do this. But somehow after meeting several times and seeing other refugee uh, women giving this type of workshops, then they start also doing it. And, um, this we have built up sort of a peer education program where we are learning from one another and then passing all these experiences to the others, especially the ones in the camps, because they are the most uh, like vulnerable from this um, system. I also, um, the other thing is, uh, yeah, when someone also comes through the group and then they find their way into the system, this is also very empowering to me. Um, of course, there are a lot of uh, barriers in the society and all, um, like all these discriminations which goes on. And also something I've realized uh, is that some people in the community, they would like to do something to assist or to help, but they don't, sometimes they don't know how, or sometimes they are afraid. And for me, this is also something I say, okay, um, I think the communities themselves should also like learn from each other and see, okay, if I want to do something, I just do it. It doesn't matter what the consequences are because I think there are people who, uh, a lot of people go out of their way to help other people. And um, I think I always say everybody who moves out, out from their country, it could be uh, war, it could be uh, poverty, it could be uh, like, uh, you know, sexual discrimination from the communities where most of us come from, they don't accept like um, maybe uh, lesbian people or trans people, you know, all these things, there are reasons to run away from your I need to move from your country or to learn away from it. It's not just something like someone, um, I think most of us, like Claudia said, we don't have this privilege of getting uh, visas. So it's not something you dream today. I want to go and get a visa and go and visit Europe or the US or whatever. So uh, in this way, it's difficult also to, you know, for the people who come and then because when they are getting here, also when we are in our countries, we are hearing a lot of democracy, a lot of uh, how the, the, how kind the Europeans are or whoever, because we are, we are hearing, okay, they are giving aids to our countries and all these things. But when you go deep into this, then you realize what is all behind this. There is nothing like aid, there is nothing like this help. But of course, there are a lot of good people and uh, generous people in the communities. And these are the people we, uh, we look upon, especially, uh, like I said, in this network of us working with, the, with people without uh, migration background, it really assists uh, most of the people who are in our group are really assisting the, uh, finding ways of assisting women. We have women sometimes who have no papers who are living on the streets and then we find a place for them. Then they stay for some time and then they can be able to get to, to the asylum system. So I find this 
actions very empowering, especially when you get somebody who has been on the street and then at, at a later date, they fight their way into the system. Mm, then there are also the, uh, for me, um, the empowering moments are also when, uh, you know, you find somebody's happy and they are, you know, uh, they start living again because sometimes it's like, you know, you come here, you have, you are like dead, you don't know what to do and all this. But in, at one point, uh, you come through our organization and then you get all this and then um, you start having a life, like I would say. Um, I think also the, the system is sort of made to make people also feel this way. But I think our, our way uh, us is to find a way to make, you know, to break this, um, this uh, link of like, okay, you are not useless. You, are, you can live in dignity. You only have to fight for your rights. You have to, to make some efforts to come out and uh, yeah, get into the, you know, into the real world and start to find things to do. Uh, also, this uh, I talked about a little bit about this network we have built with the refugee women. Uh, we go, our main work is also going to the camps and talking with the women, not only asking them to come and meet us, but we go there and talk with them. And some of these tours we make also, we go to different camps in, in, uh, in, the, in, uh, in the whole of German, or mostly most many states. And we talk to the women there. And at the end of the day, you can see how the women change and they become active because mostly they think they have no right to talk or to fight for their rights or to, to demand anything. But then we, in our workshops, we show them that it's a right to have some of these things. It's a right to ask for them because they, this is the way the system is. So if they can't give you uh, a working permit to work and care for your life, and they are giving you uh, like money from uh, welfare money, then they have you have a right to get this welfare money. They should not start cutting it because you don't have the document, this document or that document. So these are the sort of um, of the things which I find uh, empowering in in our group where people are learning from one another, uh, yeah, talking to each other and uh, making these women take steps. This I find especially very empowering because most of them, like I said, I'm, maybe I'm repeating myself, but they are there in the camp, they don't know what to do. And um, the system is made like, you become so dependent on it. So at the end of the day, you know, you have no will to do anything yourself again. And uh, when you realize, okay, I can do this, there are the women, and this is also what is more, um, a lot of power comes from. The others, these refugee women, and they, they tell us they started here and now they are there. So why can't I also, you know, uh, do the same thing or even do something better and become also somebody who can also give back to the society. This is also something we want to do. Give back to the society, not only take, because this is also the way uh, the system has made it that the community looks at people who come here, they, are, they only come to take, they only come to uh, because, you know, they are lazy, they are all these things. So we want also to, you know, to make, to let the public know, okay, this is uh, not the way things are. It's because we are not, uh, we cannot access these things and we don't have the right to access them, but somehow we know we can access them and we also need your, your, your assistance for us to, you know, to do this. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Vivian. I think very important that you're highlighting um, the the way in 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 which the system really makes it 
uh, very challenging for people to be able to <laughs> to access their rights. Even even if their rights exist, it makes it a uh, very uh, difficult for everyone. And so the the importance of you know building community and and creating these networks of support, like you were saying, uh, in in helping people fighting for their rights, I think it's very important and some sometimes something that we take for granted as as you know citizens. Many of citizens of the countries that are that are receiving and welcoming people we it's the rights it's something that it's already a given for us right and and we don't realize the the difficult bureaucratic processes and and really the fight that people have to do to have access to some of these resources um to two different levels and so i think very important uh, also what you mentioned on on helping uh women find their voice again and to be able to speak again and, and use their voices uh, for action and for organizing um and yeah i think that the aspect again of, of community, I think, uh, really resonates uh, with with creating sanctuary communities and and, and structural change, right, against against these systems. Um, and I would like Claudia as well to to join us in, in this conversation, particularly, you know, with uh, your involvement through the arts. Uh, and we had discussed of how how powerful it is to use the arts and something that it's create such a strong reaction on people um, to be able to incorporate this and, and use it for change and, and to bring messages of, of justice and, uh, and, and of solidarity, right? For people to activate this and, and create an empathy and, and, um, and really um, motivate people to, to bring into action and, and, and to reclaim their voices as well. And I would love for you to share uh, some of uh, your experience in working in, in these communities in accessing arts and um, other forms of um, opportunities and spaces to create also this this type of communities. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, our mind and uh, uh, to our group uh, form to we have find found to 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 do. The things are uh, is true throughout the art, because we I think that the art is the most the most beautiful form to to human expression, and they are involve uh, the creativity, but also the sensibility sensi sensitivity and also the patience and you know when people is involved in in the in doing art in creating artwork uh, there are a powerful uh, situation to to express and uh, but also we through the art we we can build community and we can share together and we can and, and we we use the art to demand fundamental rights um we we use the art to build together um, to show the public our public or people who who want so who who to to observe our our work uh, how is our experience how is how we how is our life but but also in this work is represent all the voices of people working together you know and it is we 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 build communities where where every one voice is, is important everyone's experience is important and we 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 don't have uh levels or an and vertical structure to 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 share we 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 take we make our decisions in in a uh, in a equality equality form 
you know and uh, yeah if we are working in a in a in in in, in a work artwork we we to us is the, the most important things there is to to build together to to heal to hear us to thinking analyzing the situation that we have we want to to show but together you know and it is so so beautiful and to to see when people uh, even at, at at the least at the last moment opinion give an opinion like a okay but I think we can we can change we can add this movement in, in dance for example because you know we we have to to show a little more strong this part uh, even in the last moment and all the all the group all people working said oh, it is a great idea let's do it but immediately you know or if if we, if say um, yeah, but I think that maybe and we, we can discuss, we can ag make agreement and we can build and, and get getting strong the community. And when we show we, our art, people, people is really touched to the, to, to this. And uh, for example, last week we made uh, a performance uh, to support Colombian protest that is happening right now. Uh, yeah, we, we just we we are restarting because because COVID nineteen now, and we have had just two practices, two meetings. And when when we when we show to the public this this work that it was no we we are building just just we are building this work, people answer with a lot sensibility, and many people come to us and say thank you, thank you for 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 showing that it is so powerful it's so. And people is res respond really toast, you know. And yeah, we we through the arts we also try to to heal and resignify resignify our violence experience because when when we share our experience. We 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 can find a hear, a heart, to 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 understand our our pain, and you know, and respect our pain, and it 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 is a important part, because in Colombia when we start Colegnas uh, Collective, um, there were many people victims of the conflict armed conflict in Colombia. But nobody now but nobody knew about that. It was just si getting, uh, get, they are they were silent about that. But when we start to talk and to feel and to think and to discuss, people put out their their experience and their feelings. And all these experience were put in the in the art in the work. And when it is caused that we have we we create a strong human relation, you know. And now even we are here in Canada, uh, our our partners. Feels feel that we are supporting them throughout the art. No, no, with money or not with just 
uh, world, they they feel they they are feeling supporting throughout the art with for us, and the, uh, we say we we feel the same, you know. Yeah. Thank you, Claudia. That's very powerful, and I think I what you said about healing it really resonates, you know, and especially you know when we think of all the stories and all the trauma sometimes that people have through these journeys, right? Or from the communities that they're coming from and the situations there, the, the importance of, of finding these safe spaces and communities to be able to connect with other people and also discover and share their own gifts, right? Uh, rediscovering the so much, the, the creativity and, um, and, and talents that people have to offer. And I think that is very critical and, and so part of our human experience, right? And so important to connect with people at that level. And, you know, that speaks through the art, but that also speaks, I think, through a lot of our spaces and what we do for accompanying people in, in, in the different process of, of asylum, right? And hospitality and welcoming people and, you know, making sure we acknowledge the agency that people have and what a better way than this, collaborative um, embodiment that art has, right? And in, in the projects that you're doing, but then also, in, as I said, we can, that's something that we could utilize um, in so many aspects of our hospitality and our organizing. Um, and, you know, what you said of creating consensus of empowering people to uh, taking actions and, you know, just using their agency. That's, um, that's very um, important, I think, and transformative uh, in so many levels. And, um, you know, we have to remember always that we're dealing with people. We're people helping people and coming together and and the, recognizing each other and, and creating the solidarity. I think it's very, very beautiful. Um, I think right now uh, I'm so thankful for uh, your stories and hearing from the amazing work that uh, the three of you have been doing. I think um, we're almost going to open up for a few uh, questions here shortly. I also just wanted to give uh, Hannah a last opportunity to um, give us a few words on what the situation had been for another community too um, that had been between these borders and, and dealing with many margins. Uh, if you could um, briefly tell us a little bit what you know the situation with uh, the 3rd of, of August uh, and the shooting um, and in, in El Paso had been and bringing together, I think, also the different lenses of um, the narratives on on race and the systems of oppression that are connected with racist regimes as well as immigration and how the community of El Paso um, responded to that and um, you know in, in what ways was it a waking call for for solidarity perhaps for for the community in, in being in between all of these borders. Um, yeah, and I think there was a question also in the in the chat, so I can answer that, and then I can, um, or I don't know which one I should do. That would or, be wonderful. Yeah, if you could, uh, if you could go ahead um, and answer the question that board, uh, Bob had on externalizing the border, and then sure. yeah, and contextualizing that would be great. And I guess we'll also give folks more time to um, uh, to write their questions on the chat uh, if they have any. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think when I refer to um, externalizing the border, it's with, you know, with, for example, the Remain in Mexico policy or the Title 42 expulsion policy, which is basically closes the border to anyone seeking protection. Um, that, you know, the impact of that policy is that it pushes the whole burden of caring for people onto Mexico, onto the Mexican government. And then at the same time, um, you know, even going back to the Obama administration, there's been an effort to, you know, provide resources for like Mexico, the Mexican government, as well as um, Guatemala to kind of harden their own borders. So, um, so you know, the US has provided training and, and supplies and funding to um, to these countries to harden harden their borders in order to block refugees from from transiting through. So even we're hardening you know our own border and and using tactics like expulsion, you know, 
criminalization of of migration, um, wall, building walls, you know, more agents like militarizing the the, the border area, uh, which is a tactic that has never worked. Like it doesn't it doesn't do what is. It, to some degree, it does what it's intended to do, which is, you know, violently deter migrants. But in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't actually work. Um, so we've taken that approach and we've kind of copy and pasted it onto other countries who, you know, could definitely use those resources for other things. And so I think, you know, if you went to the Mexico-Guatemala border, um, you would see an increased you know, presence of troops and national guards, and you would see some of the, the same patterns being shifted onto these countries um, for the, the purpose of deterring people who are migrating. Um, and even Mexico has increased its deportations of people from the interior. So Mexico has now sort of taken the US approach of like detaining people, you know, stopping them and asking for paperwork and then deporting them back to Central America or, um, yeah, deporting them back to Central America. So it's kind of, you know, taking our protection, the role of protection that we should be, that we should be adopting, that we have the resources to put in place and saying, no, we're going to, we're going to criminalize and deter migrants instead. And we're going to force these other countries to do the same, um, putting, a burden on them that they don't have the same resources to manage. So I hope that answers the question a little bit. Um, and then I think that, well, as, as Ilka mentioned, um, El Paso experienced a, a horrible um, hate crime a couple of years ago in on August 3rd. Um, and it was definitely a crime that was targeted, that was aimed at us as a Latino community, as a border community, um, and as a community that has welcomed migrants. And that's, you know, it's really not, um, I think at least I don't see you know, I see a very, like, there's a clear relationship between the way that, um, you know, migrants from Central America and from Mexico and from, you know, Africa and the Middle East, South America are treated. And, you know, the fact that that crime happens because it's the same, you know, racist system that keeps, you know, always replicates itself in different ways. Um, it just kind of takes on different you know, it shape shifts, but it's kind of the same pattern of racism. And so that was um, obviously really devastating for, for us here and um, still something we're trying to recover from. Yeah, thank you, Hannah. And um, I think that really um, connects to, to, you know, how the systems are very connected, right? And how it's not only um, migrants that are being um, the, the victims of, of racism and, and xenophobia through these narratives, right? But then uh, even uh, the communities that are trying to welcome them and, um, and, and the groups and people that are um, trying to support them also become um, targets of, of those narratives, right, that we're trying to fight through our work. Um, and so really rethinking on a more uh, big and systems level, right, the, the different uh, intersections, I guess, of, um, of these issues of, of, of migration and, and racism and how, you know, they, they interlink to create very oppressive immigration policies and, and also to incentivize, unfortunately, individuals that, um, that are uh, you know, hearing about this, um, you know, racist narratives and, and so on, and, and that generates violence, right? And so uh, with that, I also want to, you know, think about the ways that, you know, the, the many challenges that you all three, I guess it's a question from my, <laughs> from my own, if the challenges that you three 
phase in your work um, it, because of these narratives that are that are so oppressive, right? And so we're all fighting these narratives uh, through our work. And so I wanted to know how how you personally practice, you know, self care, uh, and how do you uh, turn the page from from these narratives? And and what's your counter narrative? Uh, what's what what's your hope to 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 keep it moving and and to keep this work moving forward? Um, and uh, I guess that if you can <laughs> open it again. And I also want to welcome more people to write their questions. I don't take it. Yeah, um, um, how do I do this? Because this is also very difficult to, to separate myself from what I do and Sometimes it takes a lot of uh, energy from me and um, yeah, because at the end of the day, I'm also human and uh, I'm seeing all these things and I'm also experiencing them when it comes like to racism, I'm also experiencing this in other streets or in other ways. I'm also experiencing it in uh, from people who don't even think they are racism, but when I look at their actions or, you know, I, I find them This is So it's not um, very easy to, you know, to separate me from the, from the work I'm doing. I try to do this by maybe, yeah, trying to re-energize or <laughs> going for holiday or like when I came to the, to the you know to you to visit for the visit in Mexico um, Mexico US border then I'm like I meet nice people like you and I see how hard you are fighting and how um, you know how much you achieve and also you know like how much involved you are then I get this energy to go on and um, yeah, but sometimes it's not so easy, especially when someone you have been, who has been in the group calls you when they are already back in Italy and they are saying, okay, can you please even send us just, even if it's 10 euro for us to have the food for this day or something like this, or you hear somebody you have been talking to them in the next days they have been deported, you know? Um, yeah, it's it's quite hard because, like I said, at the end of the day, you are also human, and there are also all these things which are also affecting you at the end of the day. But um, I'm also very thankful to the people I'm working with, to the people we work with, also to the women we are working with, because uh, we also find like solace from one another. We are finding solutions somehow, not so much, but the literal we do is also uh, make someone have uh, energy to go on. Uh, I don't know whether I answered your question, but <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Betty. Um, and I want to offer if there's any more questions to any of our panelists um, at the moment uh, and context or um, any other particular clarifications that people may have? And if not, I, I still would like to hear from, um, from Hannah and Claudia as well um, on what gives them hope and you know how they fight this, this narratives as well that are so prevalent uh, and that we're, we're organizing for. Uh, um, we're uh, working with victims of armed conflict in Colombia. Is our uh, Colombian armed conflict is um, is a hard experience because there are so many. Uh, bad things. I think that too much bad things. 
people have suffered and human traits treat treat yeah treat and it is we ha we i know that we we can we can just continue with our life as as nothing is happening and yeah maybe uh, right now uh, that in colombia are 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 happening a protest a big a, big, a national protest and bad people is killing a lot young people but but we i think that one day they ha it have it has to to stop we we i, I think that i i have to work to achieve that to to help to contribute uh, to get a better world and i ha i i think that if yeah if i stay just in my home watching tv or something like that uh, i can i can contribute uh, to build a better world and even the those terrible terrible situation and experience uh, we have to continue working because we we need we need urgently a better world um, elizabeth said that we are we are human and in many times we have to separate but yeah i am absolutely absolutely agree with with her because but sometimes i can do that i just i just uh, have touched uh deeply touched and just i have to cry and i have to to get uh, some relax and some tea, uh, breathe, get some breath, think, and and again start again. But it is it is because we 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 need urgent urgently uh, a better world. We I can I can rest just knowing that there are in many many places people suffering in 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 that form <laughs> you know children women men young people even senior people and it is it is why I and I sometimes <laughs> to be honest uh, sometimes I feel that it is not enough that I that I make I say but there are people maybe doing more important things but I think that every single person contribute since since their positions in their uh, using their tools and i decide to use my my tools and my patience and my life to contribute to build a better world very powerful words and i think we couldn't end with better 
words actually um very thank you <laughs> thank you Claude. i think that um, your testimony and your work is very powerful and i think you have you three um have inspired us all today um thank you <laughs> now i'll give it you to you um ulrich uh, for um any housekeeping yeah um wow thank you all um i just wanted to invite uh, all the participants who are still here with us uh, to join our next webinar on june 14th um where we will discuss with uh, three incredible speakers about uh, their work against deportation and where we will get a little bit closer also to what all of this means in relation to um, sanctuary in the sense of church asylum in the sense of taking some people inside the, the church or um, faith community building um, which is the context where this group of organizers um, started in, in, in the 80s so um, Uh, I will also post um, a link for registration for our next uh, webinar on June 14th in the chat. And I'll also post a link of the tablet where you can find addresses and more information about all the speakers of today. And I mean, we had some financial support, of course, for this webinar series. But as you can imagine, um, the work that um, our speakers today and also of the two other webinars are doing is mostly done under very precarious circumstances we are also welcome to support them ideologically and financially <laughs> um, and i hand the word back to ilka to say a final blessing um, for all of us and send us off our screens into the day or the night whatever time it is where you are right now thank you ulrich uh if, if you could join me in in prayer um Divine, thank you for letting us come together today from all over the world to listen and to learn from one another and our experiences through these different journeys. Let us not turn our backs to the margins, um, but really bring them closer at the center for work and to see you, to see the divine of you within each and every one of us the communities and the people that we're welcoming and the work that we're doing. Let us put you at the center of the work um, so that we can share the love that you want us to share with one another. And let us be transformed to this work of solidarity and let us see the gifts and love that each of us has to offer. From all the places that we're coming from and to all the places that we're going, let us share your love with one another. Thank you all for, for this wonderful time together. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you. For moderating and yeah. Bye. <laughs> Thank you yeah. very much. Oh, it was so nice spaces. Yeah, thank you, Claudia, for sharing all this. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was very nice. I mean, uh, yeah, I have no words. <laughs> yes. I hope I get to visit you one of those days. Yeah, please do. Um, but in, are you, uh, you said you're in Kiev? Yeah, I mean, I'm close, well, I mean, close by, but um, mm -hmm. get to visit Berlin. Uh, yeah, please do. And when you come, do you have my telephone number? I think I have your email. So I would love to hear it. But no, thank you so much for sharing amazing work that you're doing over there. And yeah, definitely would love to go see yeah. it. And Claudia as well, when I go back home, hopefully. And um, I'll have to stop by through Canada one of those days. <laughs> I, I would like to, to be there in this moment <laughs> because. <laughs> They are uh, fighting for our right, and there are there are example an example to every every world. It, it is amazing that uh, that it happen, happens in Colombia right now. 
<laughs> and I, I feel like, oh, I, I would like to, to be there, but but mm. staying here, they have, we, we, we have, we can contribute a lot. It's amazing because when, when the strike, when the protest movement start, media and television and news, nobody said anything about. But now, thanks, we are actively active, active a lot in, in media, in social media, all the world is looking, is watching, is yeah, is is not is observing Colombian situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and thank you for contextualizing that that for us. I think it was very critical, especially as we're all here in this. So thank you, Claudia, for making it very present. And thank you for everyone again for uh, being with us today and listening. I think I still see a few folks that are with us. Thank you so much for, uh, yeah, for creating this safe space for um, those wonderful women to, to come together and share their stories. Thank sure. mm. you. Thank you for inviting us and to, for the opportunity to, to talk, to share with our, our experience. It is very, very important. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. You. Uh, Ulrich for, for organizing all of this uh, and bringing us together and also for the um, uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation and all the folks here in different networks that are making this, this possible and, you know, keeping the work uh, going. It's so important uh, to stay connected uh, across our different parts of the world uh, with this work. So thank you. Thank you.